and welcome. This is Streetwise. My name is Terry Ann Chibet. This is a show that focuses on all things entrepreneurship. And today we've got an exciting show lined up. We're talking about building a business that is investable. So if you're in business or trying to get into business, you must stay tuned. I've got an exciting, incredible panel with me, uh, Chris Sinanu serial investor and techpreneur, Mumbi Waweru, partner Frederick File, thank you for making time to be with us, and Wamboi Gaida from Regal Africa, and Patokelo, founder Kayana, and Candid Conversations. Thank you all so much for making time to be on Streetwise today. Thank you. Okay. What, is, what would you describe as an investable business? In short, I think a business with systems and processes a business that is sustainable, a business that has governance, meaning it's well registered and you can actually buy shares in it, you can buy equity in it. But I think ultimately an investable business starts with the entrepreneur, that they have that willing mindset to get on board other shareholders and take on board other ideas and opinions. Um, those will be a quali the qualities of an investable business. And you're in the space as well, and you serve as an advisory role uh, for you know, people who are getting into the entrepreneurial space or small businesses that have been in existence um, for a while. In your perspective and within your space, what are some of the traits of these businesses that you can say, okay, this one we can get an investor for? All right. The first thing, they need to be scalable. The second thing, they need to be formal, right? Not informal, they have to be formal. The third thing, they need to be profitable or at least in the journey of being profitable, right? Because everyone wants to put money where they'll make money. And then the last one, I think, is having impact. We do have some social impact investors who want to make money, but they want to make money in a great way. So that's why you also look at businesses that have impact. So those would be the four things I would be looking at here. Mm -hmm. If we go to the Kenyan space, especially on the retail side, almost 90% of what we buy is, is, you know, is, is foreign. Mm. But there's so many young women doing things, making things at home within the cottage space. How do you help them formalize uh, within the Kayana space? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Um, so Kayana is what I call a community of women of abundance where we share our knowledge as those of us who've been in business, like myself, 20 years, with younger growing businesses. The reason why um, the idea of Kayana came about is because I felt that women need a more nurturing environment to grow their business. We get intimidated with things when we hear about scaling, <laughs> when we hear about governance. Yeah. And um, I just felt that it, maybe doing it in a friendlier way, in a more nurturing way, and encouraging these businesses to indeed put systems in place that, um, you know, it, then we will see more, more women in business be successful in business. We know that it, within the cottage industry, majority of the, of the businesses within that space are actually women-owned businesses for a variety of reasons. But that doesn't mean that the businesses cannot grow beyond being run from their home. But uh, perhaps if we had kind of like a step-by-step -step, um, um, process in, in making them uh, more uh, like tangible businesses, then we will see a higher rate of uh, success. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole ethos behind Kayana. What's an investor mindset like? You know, um, when you look at a business, when you, a young man or a young lady walks into your office or calls you and say, Chris, um, this is what I have in mind. Would you put your money on it? Or this is my business. What's your mindset at that particular point? It's typically three things um, come to mind. One, is this somebody who I want to be A, associated with from a business perspective? Because as, a, as an investor or in an investment company, once you put in money, you are, you are related. You are in an entanglement, basically. <laughs> so, so, so is this somebody who I want to be related to? The second is, um, is this pers person focused? And is it what I call a business deal or is it a business? Because there's a lot of people, they have a one-off something to do, and they come and tell you they have a business they want you to invest in, and it's really not, it's not uh, sustainable. The third thing is typically around the area of risk, but I tend to be, I'm, I'm a high-risk person myself, so I'm typically not worried about the risk. And risk, um, I'm more worried about reputational risk than losing money. Because, you see, once you do the numbers, 
you need to be able to make a decision as an investor. Is this going to make me money or is this going to make me a loss? And that decision making is very easy. It's, it's an hour's worth of, of, of tinkering with numbers unless the person doesn't have the detail. Mm -hmm. So typically, th those would be the, the, the areas that I'd look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mombi, what do you guys look at at uh, Frederick File? Uh, I think Chris said it all. Um, most of it is a, a, we start by just looking at the what are you selling, um, what the product is, what the market, as she mentioned, the scalability of it. Is it that you're just so a market opportunity today and you want to, 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 make, some to make some money out of it? And there's nothing absolutely wrong with that. Yeah. It's just a matter of there's an opportunity of seeing it. But for, for, for me, investors I deal with, you have to look at the future, about it, and how many years, five, ten years, five mostly. For, for early stage, you can do three years. Uh, you don't have to go so far as five years. Um, so we need to see that three years, what it looks like. From a cottage industry point of view, you see, scalability could be something as simple as there's two of you in it. Does it have the ability to be able to take three more? Because I, I have some businesses which I've invested in, and it's not about profitability in money terms. Mm -hmm. It's also about being able to expand the space to mentor entrepreneurs and to get people having jobs, especially where we are right now with COVID. If you can have a business that pays its rents, pays its salaries, and ensures that people can feel like they're doing something and they're getting something back, they're not idle at home. Mm -hmm. Believe me, that's good news enough for this year. I always use jams and relishes as, as an example. And perhaps you are making them in your kitchen. Have you recorded your ingredients, the actual number of items you're putting to make X amount of batches? And if, uh, if somebody in Kakamega wants to do the same thing, are you able to email them that those ingredients, right. and they're able to make the exact same thing that you're making. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Scalability. <laughs> yes. Two things I always say about scalability. One, can the business scale, right? Can you have the processes whereby it's not just one person, two people, but it can be replicated and it grows big. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing, and I think a lot of businesses don't look at, is the mindset of the entrepreneur. Most of the entrepreneurs I meet, and especially women, because I'm very passionate about women in business, they have scalable businesses so they can really grow, but they want to do it themselves, right? So they're in events, they want to do the event themselves. They, they love baking, they want to do the baking themselves. I'm, I'm a perfume, I make perfume, I want to make the perfume myself. I'm a consultant, I want to do it myself. Yeah. Then it cannot be scal scalable because you cannot do everything. So there's one thing about the company being scalable, but it's also about the entrepreneur. What's the vision that they have for the business? Because if I come to you and you don't have a grand vision for your business, and I don't see how I'll be able to make a lot of money, then I can't put business, mm -hmm. I can't put my money into your business because then you will limit me in how much money I can make. Inherently, specifically as Africans, we don't understand partnerships as a, as a base. We don't understand that it's not actually about money, typically, when you come into partnership. It's about value, and that value could be network. Yeah. It could be that one phone call that moves your business from operating at 200,000 shillings a month to 20 million shillings a month. Yeah. So that mindset, that shift in understanding that I don't have to do it all myself, that if I grow the pie, I will still have enough for me plus more for others. You know, when I read online uh, all these experiences by entrepreneurs, some say I asked for less than I should have. I asked for a lot more. I valued my company yeah. at a ridiculous, uh, yeah. ridiculous place. So what are some of the things that, you know, especially in the small businesses uh, space, that they need to think of when they are valuing the company or when they're just asking for, you know, I need X amount? Well, in my opinion, basically, is if, if you're going out saying you want 100,000 shillings, then you must know why exactly you need 100 shillings. So you normally have uh, sources and users case. So my source is 100,000 from Terian, but what's my use case? So you need to actually get to, get to the granular details of why you really need the money. Valuation is a totally different topic. Um, Sometimes it says how good you are as a salesperson, how good you are you can sell and value your company. Um, if you have any different case scenarios of maybe any of your peers who sold the business, uh, good for you.
But um, in my opinion, for small companies, it's really how good you can sell. So where do entrepreneurs start off? You know, some of these terms and processes are so intimidating that sometimes we just don't know where, you know, where to start. For someone who's a good business person or someone who wants to get to a position to be a, have an investable business, they need to learn, they need to research, they need to spend time understanding their business, understanding the industry, understanding what investors are looking for. Because if you go into a bank right now, for example, and you know that you're borrowing debt, you know exactly what the bank is going to ask for. So if you're going to go in and look for an equity investor, you also have to understand what is it that they're looking for. For if you don't know your numbers, you don't have, you don't know your business. How can you expect someone to put money in it? You're not even keeping your books. Well, you so have your numbers, you, but you don't have them in your head. <laughs> you have to know. You have to know. You have That's, to know. Let me, <laughs> let me speak from an entrepreneur's point of view who's run my business 20 years, been in business, didn't write a business plan for my first business at all. So forget about those things you guys are saying. Yeah? I just went instinctively, and I'm talking as a woman. I used my instinct, which we're even hearing now, data is showing that actually a woman's instinct is also something that you can invest in. But anyway, run my business for uh, uh, maybe I'd say 10, 15 years before I, I needed to go for, to ask for money from the bank. Let's just start at that basic level. And um, the RMs, I don't know if bankers understand how important your relationship manager is because they can actually handhold you and walk you through the process just within half an hour you know, we are, we're filing returns, we don't really know, understand what those numbers are. They can guide you and they'll teach you um, what banks are looking for before they put money in your business. So it's as simple as that. Instead of going into financial literacy terms but may confuse this young entrepreneur, yeah. it's sometimes just go to who is banking your money. I have a business I'm probably going to invest in in January next year. But the entrepreneur, knowing that they're going to be looking for an investor, got me involved nine months ago when they started the research. That's another strategy a lot of entrepreneurs. Nine months ago when they started That's the research, they came and sat with me and said, hey, I've got this idea I'm thinking about. This is how I think it will work. I said, like, good idea. Go do some research. They went, they came back, showed me some, some, the opportunity. I said, hmm, looking good. Now, why don't you test it with 50,000? And check for this. Check how the customers are going to respond. Check how the market's going to respond. Try this on the brand. Pole, 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 pole. Then they did the governance, which yeah. just means go register the business so that there's an entity. And then, slowly, slowly, they're working in it with them, themselves. They brought in a cousin. Now, the numbers are beginning. I say, okay, fine. By the time you come to me in January, this is what I'd like to see. The revenue, the operational expenses, and what you're getting on the bottom line. And this is how to arrange it. So I'm hand-holding. By the time they come to the area of investability, yeah. we have gotten something. And it may not be me who invests. It might be her. Yeah. It might be her. Yeah. But I think there's that need to handhold entrepreneurs yeah. through that walk, that which, journey. Which is what you're doing yes. at, at I, Kayan. I totally agree, actually. I, and there's, I, there's not enough emphasis that has been... We talk about mentors, and, but there's a handholding process that is just integral when it comes to um, small businesses. And um, I was very fortunate because my first business partner was my husband, and he was working for a multinational. So the minute I said I wanted to go into business, the first thing we did is we registered the business as a, as a limited liability company. Mm -hmm. Of course, now there are very many options around, around doing that. But the fact that now you're registered, then you register with the taxpayer, it already begins to regulate how you're running your business. And I, and I can understand why people may be worried about, I, I'm not sure how long my business will be. I'm not sure if this, one, if this is what I want to do. I can see where you're coming from, but I would encourage um, uh, small businesses to just register yourself as a business because it keeps you in check and now you begin to, your mindset begins to think different about your business. When you look at the data, um, especially like, let's say from KNBS, for instance, yeah. on small businesses, um, majority of which, actually the, they say almost 90% of businesses, uh, especially within the small business space, are operating or making revenue of 50,000 shillings and below per month. And uh, when you speak to people uh, within that space and the advisory level, they say it's people who don't want to grow. They're very comfortable with where their businesses are. And they say the women are the worst yes. when it comes to asking for money and looking for money. What's the experience been like? 
I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I was very lucky. As I said, I had my husband who was a man and pushed me into thinking that this business can actually employ somebody. Uh, without, honestly, that vision, I'm not sure what. I'd probably be still doing my graphic design at my, in my little space. But, um, and that, I'm telling you, there's not enough emphasis being kept on mentors and role models. We need to see tangible people who are growing their business. Even that Mama Mboga, there's value that she can add to her product. Um, if you look at, in terms of agriculture within the market, some of the vegetables that are being sold within the market are, can only last 24 hours. And you come in the evening, you're saying, I'm not going to buy this product because it looks, you know, you know, it doesn't look right. This woman hasn't been taught that she can actually dry this product, you know, it can be packaged in another way. And I think the education comes from that at that level where you can, they can see the vision of this business. Oh, I can do more. Oh, I can employ more people, oh, you know. And I, I, have to, I can't emphasize it enough. We need to have um, more role models. We need to have more examples of those 50,000 shilling businesses we're talking about scaling and growing into 5 to 10 million shilling businesses. People don't talk about that journey. Yeah, but we need to speak about it. Experience? With this women investors, they need, and we're talking with Pat about that, the whole mindset shift. You need to know that you need to be scalable or at least be part of the supply chain of a great business. And that's, I think, the way that women will become great in this. Because one of the things that I'm doing also right now, besides my company, is I work for Organization of Women in International Trade. Again, we're trying to encourage people to do international trade. But what you need to do is educate them. So there's a lot of information that is missing. You need to educate them, and they need to see role models. So I'm always encouraging more people to do that. But women cannot do it alone. They also need men to support them. So if we can have Chris invest in more women in business, <laughs> we can do that. But I think it's been, uh, it's scary. But a lot of them are scared because of not understanding the numbers. So know your numbers. Let's not assume that the Mama Mboga or the guy selling shoes on the, on the wants streets to wants to stay as is. They want growth. The first thing is, do they, they, do, do they know better than what they're doing? Sometimes it's an issue of understanding this is what's on the other side. Then the second thing is, how do I get there? And that's where the hand-holding comes in. I feel if we spent a little more time and effort mentoring, coaching, and teaching people how to just think about their business in terms of a model, I think we'll have more businesses scaling and those businesses hiring more people. It's, it's just an issue of where do we spend our time and where do we spend our effort? Let me comment about women in business. I believe strongly, and a lot of men folk will want to cut my neck for this, women are 10 times better in business than, women, than men. That's just the fact of the matter. <laughs> Genuinely, and, and it's because of a few very basic stuff. Attention to detail, mm -hmm. that determination which says, I'm not going to give up today and tomorrow because I've got kids at home to feed or I have uh, relatives to, to, to take care of. And thirdly, simply because there is, there is that driving force that says, you know what, we're going to, we're, we've, we've gotten into this and we're going to try as much as possible. Most often than not, a lot of women are scared of the numbers. I can tell you, yeah. my wife, yeah. the biggest challenge we ever have, she, I ask for numbers and I'm not a nice guy when I ask for numbers. That's true. <laughs> Teria knows. And I won't let you go. I will call you and I will, I will keep on hounding you because numbers is really what it is. But the truth of the matter is that, and from the advisory point of view, all that is needed, most of these businesses, if you depersonalize the man numbers, if you get somebody else to do the numbers in the way the numbers are supposed to be, so that conversations can be held from a neutral platform, things are good. So most of those small businesses, all they need is someone to help them. And sometimes all it costs is 2,000, 5,000, I have some businesses where they hire an accountant for 5,000 shillings a month because the number of transactions or what has to be done is very little. And they, they, the accountant come in, can come and do it. And that gets, helps me to get my numbers. I get the visibility I want. But it also helps me to be able to have a conversation with the entrepreneur from a point of view that we understand each other. Mm -hmm. And it teaches them how the numbers should be done. Mm -hmm. So the flip side of what he's saying is, and, I, and I, it's so important to know your numbers, is that what about if you are actually running a very successful business, but because you do not know, you're not in the mindset of thinking in terms of scaling and growing it. So you're busy operating here, you don't know the numbers, you don't know what your turnover is annually, 
and you'll always remain in that space, yet your business is turning over, is bringing in lots of money. Mm -hmm. So you're, it's almost like you're losing an opportunity by the, the ignorance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's also the flip side of that is, yes, maybe the business is too small and you, you, you don't think that you, didn't, you need to know your numbers, mm -hmm. but what about if without you knowing that, it's actually a very successful and profitable business? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't have much time, but I want to very quickly touch on the issue of relationships and how you build a relationship with a potential investor or how important or if at all it is important to build a relationship with an investor. Is it easier to knock on the door, I don't know you, or is it easier to build a relationship and then eventually get into into, into well, the entanglement? Looking at me, so yeah. I guess I, yeah. I, I, so, so I think it's, um, relationships are the most important thing um, in the industry, in what, whatever business line you are working in, whatever stage you are in. So either you're an entrepreneur, you're starting, I, I'm on concept, I need a bit of cash, but I need to know Chris because I have a good relationship with Chris. Then um, whatever stage of business you are in, especially within the early stage of your business, it's really relationship based. It's really about, I have a good friend, like he said, you need a good partner, what's the value of my partner, what, you can't do it by yourself because these are actually the, the key areas. Um, once you go there, once you grow your business, like what she mentioned, it gets to a phase where you're large enough, you're making money, don't be surprised. They don't know the numbers. They don't actually, they, they are traders. Some of them are just traders. I, they know they're making money. You still have to go through the same process of hand-holding. So the hand-holding thing doesn't start from from a small business, even a large organization, you're still doing hand-holding. So it's a, I guess it's a conversation from where I'm sitting from. You continuously have to have the conversation, no matter what advisory you're doing. It's very new to a lot of people. It's very new in this market, um, but it's getting better. These days, you, you can say this Java or whoever else, you've seen the investment going around. You've seen it grow. So how has it grown? So there's a lot of stories to give examples to. Um, but the relationship thing is really... Uh, I think for me is the most important thing yeah. uh, from an investor perspective and from a client perspective. Yeah, then I, I guess uh, Chris's uh, story alluded to that about the young person that came to you with an idea and how you know sh it will be easier for you to then say, I've handheld this person yeah. for one year, you can invest in this business. Yes. Okay. So as we quickly wind up, a uh, word of advice or final thing you'd like to say to somebody who's looking an investment at whatever stage their business. Register your business. Register, register. I cannot say it enough. It needs to be formalized and you need to have an, somebody or a group of people holding you accountable for what you're doing. So we call it the uh, personal board of advisors. Those are the two things that I would say. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And for me, yes, I agree with her. Formalize your business, formalize your business. But the key here is your numbers. You need to know your numbers. I always say numbers tell a story. Your financial statements, you have to understand that. You have to build a good team behind it. Governance is very important. Get it registered. And once you do that, then you can be investable and then you can scale up. But the bottom line is numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm a numbers girl, so. <laughs> Mommy? Um, so I don't want to repeat what my uh, friends here have said. So for me, baby, I will say scalability and timing. Um, sometimes you can be too early or sometimes you can be too late. So I think research uh, turns, uh, research is also important on the timing. So if you're building a product, is it in need now? Is it a need tomorrow? Will it be there in one year or not? So timing is important. Um, research, a lot of people don't do research in that industry. You don't know your competitors. You don't know what's out there. Uh, and of course, the, the most important thing uh, is the scalability aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Chris? It's all been said. <laughs> That's why they say ladies first. <laughs> KY, I say KYB, KYN, what are those? Know your business, know your numbers, know your customer. That's all. Mm -hmm. So what oh, market are you going know, for? Know your, know your business, know your numbers, know your customer. Fantastic. <laughs> what a way to end the show. Thank you all so much for watching. I'd like to thank my panelists um, for giving us your great insights, which will definitely go a long way in educating, teaching, and begin that 
trickle down effect of hand holding and coaching. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you know, those of us who are watching will be able to reach out to the organizations that you represent um, you know, for that hand holding that, that, they, that, they, that they would need. Uh, so we've had on the set Chris Sananu, techpreneur and serial investor, uh, Mombi Waweru, partner Frederick File, um, pa Anne Wamboi Gaida, Regal Africa, and Pato Kello, founder Kayana. And thank you all so much for watching. You've been watching Streetwise. My name is Terry Anchebet. Until next time, we'll talk business.